Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm the MC Xiaying. Before the distinguished lecture starts, may I invite all of you to rename your zoo discipline name to Name Institute to facilitate today's discussion and use chat and raise hands functions for posting questions during the talk. Mute your microphones while not speaking, and there will be a group photo screenshot later. Now let's invite Professor Kenny Leon to give an introduction about the state key lab of marine pollution. Professor Leon, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sai Ying Xin. Uh, on behalf of our state key laboratory of marine pollution, I offer my warmest welcome to all of you to join this distinguished lecture to be given by Professor Jenny Starbuck. Um, I have uh, many reasons to invite Jenny. The first one is that uh, she is really successful female scientist in Australia. Uh, and also her uh, uh, research encompass not just the basic science, but also trying to gather information to help better management of environmental pollutants and provide solid data uh, to help uh, the authority to make uh, informed decisions. Uh, this will help uh, to achieve sustainability and sustainable development. Uh, the second reason is that uh, she is female. I, I find that uh, we have more and more females uh, PhD students uh, in Hong Kong and also elsewhere. Uh, she is uh, our role models as a very successful female scientist uh, we can look up to. Then, uh, and uh, we decide that uh, in our uh, distinguished lecture series, we will try to uh, alternatively with a male and female scientist uh, uh, to share with us. The third point is that uh, she is our uh, 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 very good friend. She has been working in uh, our city, uh, city University of Hong Kong for uh, a, a quite long period in the past, uh, so that we, we know each other very well. Uh, and she is very willing to share her knowledge and experience with uh, young scientists. Uh, I think uh, today we're going to learn a lot from her. Uh, then I also want to make a Chinese quote. Uh, is, in Cantonese, we say in Mandarin, in, in translation, that means that to learn is to encounter one's own ignorance. So the, after learning, you want to learn more. That, that is the idea for our distinguished lecture. Um, since I see uh, uh, not many new people, most are good friends. They know our laboratory quite well. So I will skip the introduction today. So now uh, I pass on to uh, uh, Dr. C uh, to uh, introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome all of you again. Thank you very much, Professor Liang. And uh, now, could you please open your camera for taking a group photo for all the audience? Sorry. I is that Hello. Okay? Yeah, but um, Professor um, Stubber made me oh. to um, turn off the share screen first because I have to take the photo in gallery view. So um, would you mind, please? Hey, I'll, I'll stop sharing and we'll just do that again. Yep. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you. So everyone turn on the cameras. So your lovely face. Okay. Are you ready? Um, please smile. One, two, three. And then the next page. One, two, three. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Jenny Stauber. Um, Dr. Stauber is a chief research scientist at 
Cyroland and Water Sydney, Australia, as well as adjunct professor at the Lanthrop University and a visiting professor at the South China Normal University, Guangzhou. Dr. Stauber is an accountant ecotoxicologist with expertise in the bioavailability and the toxicity of contaminants in marine and freshwater systems, with particular interest in the downstream impacts of mining and the development water and the sediment quality guidelines. Dr. Stauber chairs and serves on a large number of expert advisory panels to the Australian government and the global mining industry on areas as diverse as chemicals risk assessment, reef water quality, and coral seam gas. She is a fellow of both the Australian Academy of Science and Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, as well as a SETEC fellow. She was a recipient of Australia's Land and Water Eureka Prize in 2006 and has authored over 375 journal papers, book chapters, and reports. Today, Dr. Stauber will give us a speech about an environmental risk framework for deep sea mine tailings placement. Dr. Stauber, please. Thank you very much for that introduction. Can you see my full slide screen? Yes, okay. yes. Good. All right. Thank you. And look, I'm delighted to be here to talk to you today as part of the lecture series. I'm going to be talking about mine waste going into the ocean and particularly the deep sea and particularly about a project that we did to develop a framework so that we could assess the risk of these deep sea mine tailings placement. So you know that the deep sea is a difficult environment to work with, and it's also a difficult environment for organisms because of the extreme low temperatures, the very high pressures that are at depth, and I'm talking about around 4,000 metres below the surface. We've got very low light conditions, of course, on the seabed, and the seabed itself is often a very soft clay sediment with very little, um, very little, oh, sorry, I've just got something coming in on my screen. Uh, so something's just happened. So let me just go back again. Is that okay still? Yeah, someone was trying to take over my screen. Um, so the interesting thing about the deep sea is that it's very low in organic matter. It's just relying on the detritus and the dead organisms that come down from above. So it's low organic matter, so very nutritionally poor for the organisms that live there. It's also got a lower pH than at the surface. And because of the temperature and the pressure, we find that the abiotic, that's the physicochemical reactions are faster at depth because of the pressures, but the biological reactions tend to be much slower because of those high temperatures. The environment also has a lot of unique and endemic species. So what we find is that the biodiversity is very high, but it's quite patchy. And so the abundance in the biomass of organisms is actually quite low. They are usually very um, slow growing. They have very low metabolic rates and they live for a long period of time relative to organisms closer to the surface of marine environments. And because they're used to this very stable environment down deep, they, we think that they're potentially more vulnerable to disturbance. And so that's why it's very important to be protecting them. And of course, there's not much oxygen down at those kind of depths. And so the primary producers, of course, are not algae, but they're the chemoautolithic trophic bacteria that use sulfide um, and methane potentially as their um, supply rather than oxygen. So what I'm going to do now is try and show you a short video. It just goes for about three minutes and I'm going to play it now. I hope you can hear and see it. It's really just to illustrate some of the beautiful organisms, the jellyfish, the anemones, that many of them are bioluminescent at these types of deaths. And this was a video that was produced by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And um, it's available on YouTube if you want to follow it up, but just shows you some of the variety of creatures. So we've got about three minutes. So let's see what happens when I press play. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, some beautiful creatures there. So I hope you were able to see and hear that that properly. So it's an amazing environment and it's something that we obviously have to protect. So the two threats to the deep sea currently are deep sea mining. And that's where particularly there's polymetallic uh, manganese mod nodules on the ocean floor that are very valuable in terms of their minerals. And so deep sea mining basically, as it's shown on the right here, uses a dredge to suck up a lot of material. And then most of that material is, is um, returned to the bottom and can cause sediment plumes and, and impacts from turbidity and so on. And the other sort of threat, if you like, is what I'm going to be talking about, which is mine tailings waste disposal, where a plume of waste tailings from the mine operating on land is disposed of at, at depth. And so both of these uh, represent threats to our ecosystems on the deep sea floor, but they're also economically also very important. So what is deep sea tailings placement? So it's the discharge at depth of the waste material from a land mine. So what happens is that the pipe usually goes down to a depth of about one or 200 metres. And then from that pipe, a density current of tailings, particles and liquor are released. And the idea is that the density plume flows down the slope and the particles and tailings end up settling deep on the seafloor, usually several thousand metres below the surface and certainly well below the lighted upper layers, the euphotic zone. It's a little bit similar to submarine tailings disposal, which has been practiced largely in North America and Europe, but that's at much shallower depths. Those tailings are probably only placed at a few hundred metres rather than a few thousand metres deep. So I'll be talking about the deep sea tailings disposal today. And it's important to remember that it's not just sediment particles that are in that density current that flows down the slope. It's actually a complex mixture of water and sediment. It contains many of the metals that were not extracted from the mine, nickel, chromium, gold, cobalt, and so on. It also contains process chemicals like flotation agents and flocculants, as well as other chemicals, surfactants, acids, ammonia, and so on. So it's actually a very complex mixture of liquid and solids that go down um, and get deposited on the sea floor. And the reason that it is popular, not only is it economically quite feasible, but in many of the areas, particularly in the Western Pacific around Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, many of the locations, the land uh, is not available to build tailings dams, or there's other land uses that are competing for that, or there might be uh, uh, climate related issues such as high rainfall or geological instability that make tailings dams on land difficult to um, maintain and, and prevent from collapsing. So it is uh, economically and a favorable op option for many mines, particularly in the Western Pacific. But of course, it is highly controversial. And it's partly because there's no really um, worldwide regulation of deep sea tailings placement. So it's not covered by the London Protocol because tailings are considered to be inert inorganic geological material. So they're not covered under that convention. And unlike deep sea mining, which is regulated, it's regulated by the International Seabed Authority, whereas the deep sea tailings placement doesn't have any global regulations yet, although they are being worked on. And so with the demand increasing for nickel in particular and other metals for batteries and electric vehicles. And a lot of this mining uh, for these type of elements comes from our region in the, the Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And so it, it's also unfortunately a hotspot for coral diversity. So you've got these tensions between mining and a very highly biodiverse marine environment. Um, so it, it's, it's there's quite some tensions and so it's quite controversial, the, the whole operation of deep sea tailings placement. So what are the potential issues? The tailings placement, the waste placement has the potential to affect not only the organisms that live on the bottom of the seafloor in the sediments, the benthic organisms, but it can also affect organisms in the water column, the pelagic species. And of course, we don't know a lot about the species yet, although we are finding out more about the species at depth because it's very difficult and challenging and expensive to work in such deep sea environments. 
you need remote operated vehicles and, and some of the things that we just saw in that video that are able to photograph video and capture those deep sea organisms. So it's a difficult environment to work in and we still don't have a lot of information about the impacts of deep sea tailing placement and other deep sea mining. So although most projects when they are proposed have to undertake an environmental impact assessment, there's usually not risk assessments as such. So there's no published risk framework for deep sea tailings placement currently available. And so the aim of our project, which was funded by the Metals Environment for Research Associations, our aim was to develop a framework to assess the risk of deep sea tailings placement, a framework that could be applied to any particular location. Um, it was qualitative, semi-quantitative because there wasn't a lot of data out there. Um, but this is what we've just completed this year uh, and just having published currently in a science of the total environment. So with any risk assessment, the first part is problem formulation. So it's understanding the context. And so here I just have a map showing the locations of deep sea tailings placement operations that either are current or proposed. And you can see while there was two um, in uh, Europe, there's a uh, aluminium um, one and the Kaili Baki mine in Turkey is actually a, a lead, zinc and, and, and copper operation. Most of the deep sea tailings placement operations are, are here in the, in the uh, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea area, the Southeast Asian Western Pacific region. And this is because this region has the right oceanography. You need to have deep water very close to the coast so the pipelines don't have to go out too far. You need to have quite a, a steep continental slope, more than 12 degrees, so the tailings will flow down that slope onto the seafloor. Uh, and you need to have the right oceanographing and current conditions, no upwelling so that the tailings can't get up into those surface waters. And so this is why some of these locations here are ideal. Now the risk is going to be very dependent on the particular mine. So it depends on the size of the operation. So for example, the Batu Hichau mine, that is the copper mine in Indonesia, and I'll be talking a bit about that as a case study towards the end of the talk. It is one of the largest DSTP operations in the world. It discharges about 140,000 tonnes of tailings every day into the ocean. It's probably 10 times bigger than some of these other mines. Ramu Nickel is probably 10,000 tonnes per day. Uh, and Lahir gold mine in Papua New Guinea is, is even less. So the risk is going to depend very much on the tonnage of tailings released and also the type of ore, whether it's copper like Badu Hija or whether it's a gold, gold mine, for example. And it's going to depend on the tailings reactivity and the age of the mine, because many of the tailings oxidize over time, so they're not always the same. The other risks are going to be related to the treatment of the tailings before discharge. So what they do is to make sure that density current flows down the slope and settles on the bottom, they do various things to the tailings before release. So they will de-aerate them to remove the oxygen. They'll dilute them with seawater and very carefully control the density so there won't be any releases of tailings up into the surface waters. Sometimes they also do other processing uh, with flocculants to remove, for example, cyanide by adding iron. So all of these things are going to impact the risk uh, of the operation. So it's very operational specific. So as part of the, the um, risk assessment project, of course, it's always important to have a conceptual model. So this was our conceptual model built on several others that we'd used previously. And this is just to show you here that, um, and I'll perhaps find the pointer if I can. So, so here we have the pipe that's going down, in this case, about 150 metres, and that's where the tailings are discharged from. And because they're more dense than seawater, the tailings go down the slope and settle ultimately into this area, which we call the primary deposition zone. That's where we predict the tailings will be based on the modelling done before the operation starts. But as always, there's always bottom currents that can potentially spread these tailings further. So you can get very thin patches of tailings right a long way from, from the discharge point. And so we call this the secondary deposition zone, which is a transition zone as it moves towards the reference and control where there's no impacts at all. Also, what we find is that usually probably 85% of the tailings stays in this density current. 
but sometimes 10 or 15% can actually shear off as a plume. So you get these subsurface plumes at various depths that can come off depending on where the peak decline is. And this can mean that the tailings particles and the liquor can actually move quite a long way horizontally. And so it's very important that these plumes stay well below the euphotic zone, the upper surface layer, so that they can't contaminate or affect any of the organisms in this top 200 meters. So usually the locations are chosen so that these upwellings, which can occur at certain times of the year in the Western Pacific, we try and make it so that the locations are chosen so that the upwellings do not bring um, material from deep down up to the surface. Uh, and so that's, again, it's a, a choice of location. There's quite a few criteria that have to be met for this to be done in a sustainable way. The sort of stresses that come that we're talking about here, apart from the particulate tailings themselves, we've got particulate and dissolved metals that we're particularly concerned about. We have processed chemicals, we have turbidity from the tailings particles, particularly if there's these subsurface plumes. And there's also things like the change in pH, temperature, and even noise at that outfall is a stressor that we have to consider when we're doing a risk assessment. So for our risk assessment, what we did was we split the risks into eight separate zones. So we have this mixing zone here close to the pipe. And for that zone, we had a pelagic zone, which was the top 200 metres. And then we had a bottom zone, which included the water and the sediments falling down that continental slope. Then in the primary deposition zone, where we expect the tailings to be deposited on the sediment, we had the benthic zone, We're looking at benthic organisms. We had the deep pelagic zone below 200 metres. And then we had this upper pelagic zone, up the upper 200 metres. And the same thing in this secondary zone, we had the benthic zone where we assessed the risk, we had the deep pelagic and the upper, the shallow pelagic. So we had eight zones in all, and we did the risk assessment for each of those eight zones. But of course, it's important to remember, although we assess the risk in different zones, the, the zones are interconnected. And you can have these conveyor belts with organisms that migrate daily up and down the water column. So you'll have some organisms that can migrate up and down, particularly zooplankton and phytoplankton. They can move a few hundred metres. They are the prey to organisms in this middle zone. And these organisms can then be the prey for these deeper organisms. So it's like a conveyor belt effect. And so all the zones are actually linked to some extent um, biologically. So it's important to remember that even though we're assessing the risk in the different zones. <coughs> Excuse me. So the other thing that's important to do at the beginning is to make sure that all the stakeholders, that is the government, the industry, the community, the regulators, all agree at the beginning on some of the criteria for these operations. So it's really important for there to be agreement about what ecosystem values and ecosystem services need to be protected, our assessment endpoints in the risk assessment jargon. And we can't always measure these assessment endpoints, so we need to make sure that we've got measurement endpoints. How can we measure the values that we want to protect? What sort of things can we measure? For example, we might measure chlorophyll A as an indicator of phytoplankton in the surface layers. Really, really important is this one. Because the tailings are going to smother the organisms underneath, underneath as they settle on the seafloor, there has to be agreement about what spatial area is acceptable as a sacrificial zone where everything will die. That's really important, how big this sacrificial zone is agreed to be. And finally, we need to think about, can we mitigate any of the risks by treating the tailings up the top on land before they go down the pipe and settle on the ground? So there's lots of things to consider about what we ex accept as a community and as industry and as regulators about what is the acceptable risk. So in any risk assessment, there's always an exposure assessment and an effects assessment. Now I don't have time today to go into detail about these, but I've just got a few slides and just suffice it to say that we looked at all the literature, particularly focusing on literature since 2010, plus our own experience of working on deep sea tailing placement with oceanographers and others for the last 20 or so years to try and understand 
uh, what data we've got out there to assess exposure and effects. So here we have just um, the oceanographers we work with, they use a range of models. They use oceanographic models, they use dispersion models for the plumes, they use density models, and they try and predict where those tailings will end up on the seafloor, the tailings footprint. So that's one thing that we use a lot to understand exposure. We then look for data from sediments and water that have been collected in these zones, particularly quantitative data we were looking for. And we look at what evidence there is for how thick the tailings are. So in some of the operations, the tailing thicknesses would be two or three metres on top of the, the sediment in that primary deposition zone. And, you know, usually we think that perhaps five centimetres is the threshold for survival for many organisms. So if they're covered by more than five centimetres, often they won't survive. So when you've got tailing thicknesses of two or three metres, you can see that those organisms are going to be completely um, removed in that area. But in the secondary deposition zone further away from the pipe, we often have tailing sicknesses that are less than one millimetre and very patchy. So organisms can often survive in those secondary zones. And what we found, if we just have a look over here, I've just got an illustration here. These two pictures show the tailings from the Badohijia copper mine. You can see they're very silty. Half the sediments have got a particle size of less than 45 microns. So they're very fine, very silty very grey and very sludgy. And they're very different to these sediments on the right. These are the natural sediments in that area. You can see they're a very different colour. They're much coarser and, and very sandy. So organisms that are used to living in this type of sediment, all of a sudden are going to have, you know, centimetres or metres of this material on top of them. So it's um, obviously a, a difficult environment to survive in from smothering. Also, we didn't find much information on the process chemicals. We know that chemicals go out in the liquor with the tailings, but we assume that they're quite rapidly diluted in the seawater at these depths, but there's absolutely no quantitative information on organisms exposure to these extra chemicals. So that was the exposure side. We also looked at the literature for what sort of effects from what type of studies um, do we know about deep sea tailings placement. And I've already mentioned that the main effect is smothering. So this hypersedimentation, when you've got tailings on top of organisms, they're burying and smothering the organisms that live in the sediment. That's the primary impact. But you can also get physical disruption from the tailings particles um, because of their different sizes, as I showed you previously. And also sometimes the angular shapes of the, the tailings particles are very different to the more rounded natural sediments. And that can cause abrasion and friction and also can cause damage to organisms. Then you can have indirect effects uh, when the organisms, it's, it's organically poor, nutritionally poor environment. So they might ingest the tailings particles and that can also cause indirect effects. And also they can also have starvation if they're buried and they can't access the organic material floating down from the upper surface layers. As I mentioned, we can have toxicity due to the chemicals or the metals um, in the tailings. The metals can be re-released um, in various processes um, down in deep. And so these can accumulate in the organisms, both in the sediment organisms and the water organisms. And then we can have other things that happen. We can have upwellings. Sometimes you can have slumps and slope failures um, or pipe breaks. And this can give uh, turbidity, which can reduce the light and therefore reduce productivity of organisms in those shallower waters. So these were all in the literature as potential effects, but it was much harder to find actual evidence for the actual effects themselves. And so the evidence that we looked at came from a number of different types of, of, of studies. So there's a lot of material from the shallow um, tailings disposal um, from the Northern Hemisphere, particularly Norway and Scandinavia. So we could use some of that information to try and understand the impacts. There's dredging studies in shallow waters that tell us a little bit, a bit about how organisms respond to, to smothering. There's been field monitoring and studies around actual DSTP locations uh, in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia and, and elsewhere that we can use the data from. Then there's people who've done mesocosm studies. So what they do is that they collect the deep sea species and bring them to the surface. And if you bring them up very slowly over about an hour, 
and keep them cold on the ascent, then many of those species can cope with the reduced pressure at the surface. And so then they can look at toxicity of various contaminants to those deep sea species, but on the surface. Or you can have the other approach, which is what we've done in some of our studies, because we haven't had access to the deep sea biota. We've actually then collected the tailings um, and sediments from the deep and brought them to the surface and then done some testing with the shallow water species as surrogates. And this is some of the work um, we did for the Lahir gold mine here in, in Papua New Guinea. So we collected a range of sediments. Here's the Lahir Island. We know the deposition zone and the footprint. So we could take sediments in the deposition zone and out towards the reference sites. And then we tested those deep sea sediments for toxicity to a range of shallow water species as surrogates. And what we found was with the alga, well, obviously there's going to be no algae at depth, but it does tell us a bit about the toxicity of the tailings. And we found it was some of the organics that were causing the toxicity rather than the metals. But to our little sediment dwelling organisms like our amphipods and bivalves, we found that toxicity was due to a number of factors. Some of it was due to these metals. Some of it was due because they ingested the tailings particles. The gills got clogged and that caused effects. And they also um, starved over the period of the experiment. And we found that if we fed these organisms over the 10 day tests, that toxicity was completely removed. So there's a whole lot of interacting effects um, that we can find with these, testing these deep sea sediments with surrogate species. That was the impacts on the sediment dwelling species, but we can also have effects on pelagic species in the water column. And we've done work for a number of different deep sea tailings placement operations around the world. And we've used shallow water species and tested the toxicity of the tailings and the tailings liquor. Really, that doesn't tell us about the deep sea, but it does tell us something about these plume shears that shear off as the, the density plume descends. So it can give us some information about the toxicity of the liquor itself as it's descending. And so from those tox tests, we can actually calculate what a safe dilution of the tailings liquor would be, and we can compare that to hydrodynamic modeling. And in this particular case, we found that we needed dilutions of up to one in 3000 with seawater to remove any toxicity. And in this case, the dilutions they were achieving were one in 6000. So the risk was low because the tailings liquor was being well diluted. So some of the toxic components were being well diluted and causing less of an impact. Uh, so this type of work tells us a little bit about it, uh, what's happening, but of course, ideally you'd be doing work on the deep sea floor with remote operated vehicles if, uh, if the money was available. So that was sort of the effects. Now let's quickly look at the risk characterization because this was the novel component of what we did in this project. So what we did was we set up a whole lot of exposure pathways. We call them causal pathways and causal networks. So we looked at all the sources um, whether it was the tailings density current or a pipe failure or a plume. We then looked at the environmental processes that would release stresses, chemicals, physical stresses from the source. And then we looked at all the effects that we could think of on a whole range of receptors. And we grouped the receptors into pelagic and also into the benthic. And the benthic ones, we, we split this into three categories. We had sessile macrofauna, so they're the organisms in the sediment that can't move around. We had the mobile macrofauna in the sediment, and then we had the bacteria and the myofauna like the nematodes in another group. And then what we were able to do was score each of these pathways, and I'll show you this now. So this is just to show you all of the different sources we looked at, all the different environmental processes, we looked at a range of stresses, including noise, which was an interesting one because there wasn't much information about the noise of the plume going down, um, as well as these other, other metals, pH, temperature, turbidity, and, and so on. Then we looked at a range of effects. We were looking at productivity loss, gill clogging, changes in predator-prey relationships, as well as the more traditional toxicity and bioaccumulation impacts. And then we had our receptors. We had a group of receptors that were in the surface waters that we wanted to make sure we protected the megafauna, the charismatic megafauna. And then we had these three groups of the sediment dwelling organisms that I mentioned. 
So what we had to do was every one of those sources and pathways, and there was 246 causal pathways that we assessed the risk of. And in each of those pathways, we have to score the link. So we have to think about whether the source is actually going to cause a process. So for example, with a, if there's a pipe leak or damage to a pipe, pipe, would there be a tailings release? And we score that link. And then if there's a tailings release, would that cause a stressor like turbidity to be released? And so we'd have to score that link. And the way we did it was that we, because of the limited data, we just had three levels of likelihood. So whether something was possible, whether it was likely, and whether it was certain. And in terms of consequence, we just had two levels, whether something caused a significant effect, that is a material effect, or whether it didn't cause a material effect. And so by material, we mean it depends, the effect would depend on the spatial area, it might depend on the duration of the exposure to that stressor, it might depend on the sensitivity of the receptor, its vulnerability and its resilience. So all these things were taken into account to decide whether something was material or not material. So just for example, if we look at this pipe leak, if we're trying to see if there was a pipe failure, that would certainly lead to tailings release or most likely. So it's certainly possible. Is it material? Yes, it would be of, of, of material consequence if that happened. Is it likely? Well, probably not if the pipeline operations are running properly. So we would score that link as a two. And then if there is a tailings release, we then score the link to the stressor. So is a tailings release likely to cause an increase in turbidity? Well, you'd say it's certainly possible. It would certainly cause a, a significant increase in, in turbidity if, if there was a tailings release. And yes, um, if there is a tailings release, it's quite likely that that stressor, that increase in turbidity would be found. And so we would score that here as a, as a three and so on down the decision tree. And we had to do that for all, as I said, 246 pathways in eight different zones. So it's quite an undertaking. And from then we just build a qualitative table. I'm sure you've seen this where we just had our levels of likelihood, our two levels of consequence. And then depending on the score from that previous decision tree, we then give it a category. So it was either low risk or potential risk or high risk, or in the case of a certain event where it was going to be of high consequence material, then that would be a very high risk. And so we scored all of those links and all of those pathways. So what happens then is you, get, you build up a causal network like this. So we have all of the sources here. We have the, the processes here all the stresses in this particular zone, all of the effects that we might see, and all the receptors over here on the right in purple. And this is just for the mixing zone, the, the water in that mixing zone. And so we can score each of these pathways shown by different colors with their high risk or low risk. And then we can follow through and determine which are the most important pathways from a risk perspective. Now that's a very complicated one, but here's a simpler one. This is the secondary deposition zone. So this is the zone away from the main tailings deposit. And this is probably the zone we're most worried about because this is where tailings are not predicted to settle. So from a monitoring and a, an environmental perspective, we know that the primary zone is going to be impacted from smothering, but we don't want the impacts to spread beyond the predicted footprint into this secondary zone. So here's just an example of a simple network based on those causal pathways I showed you. So let's see if we just look at the tailings density current. That is a, a source. Tailings deposition would be the process that would lead to dissolved and particulate metals being released that can cause toxicity to benthic macrofauna that can't move. And all of those links there are all scored as high risk because they scored a three. But there's alternative pathways to that particular receptor as well. So we have another pathway, tailings density current can cause tailings or sediment remobilization, which can release metals, which can cause toxicity, which can affect those fauna that can't move in the sediments. Now those pathways are all high risk, except for this link here. This was assessed as being a potential risk, but not a high risk. So that means that whole pathway that I just described becomes just a potential risk pathway. 
because it's based on the weakest link, the lowest link. So this sort of causal pathways and causal networks allows us to focus on the pathways of highest risk that we can then do the monitoring and focusing on in particular. So what we end up with in, in just simple terms is a table like this. And you can see that of all the pathways we scored, I've got the three primary zones here and the different zones within those zones. And you can see if we look at the high risk pathways, there are 11 high risk pathways, but they are all just in the mixing zone or the primary zone where the tailings deposit. And it's only on the benthic biota, the pelagic, the water column species in those zones are not very high risk. It's mainly the benthic, the benthos, as you would expect from where the tailings are settling. If we look at the high risk pathways, again, there's 18 pathways, but again, they're in all the zones, but they're only again on the benthos. So the benthos is the most at risk. Then if we look at the potential risk pathways, we can see that there's many potentially risky pathways in both the water column and in the benthos across most of the zones. And then there's a whole group of pathways that we consider to be low risk. And then there's pathways where the links are not possible. You just can't get an exposure. So that's the type of thing. And we can look at those individual pathways and hone in on our monitoring and our, our, our risk assessment and, and any medi mediation or remediation that could possibly be done. The other thing that's good about these causal networks, and we didn't do it in this project because we didn't have a specific site. We were just developing a generic um, framework. But what you can do, if you have a, a particular location for a project that's doing deep sea tailings placement, you can actually map the high risk areas onto the footprint of the location where those tailings are discharged. So you can map out the high risk pathways from our risk assessment. And that also allows you to hone in on the hotspots and concentrate your monitoring on those hotspots. And so that's something we would like to do um, if we had more, more time and money on the project to actually do a spatial component and try it out with an actual real um, a real uh, project, a real deep sea tailings project in the Western Pacific. So people often ask what happens then? How, how easy is it for the organisms to recover when they've been smothered and buried for a long period of time? Many of these operations go for, for many um, decades. So we know from, particularly from closed mines in the Northern hemisphere, that the seawater sea quality, even in that mixing zone, improves quite quickly. It will improve in days or weeks. But we know that the benthic organisms, the ecosystems at the bottom of the ocean, take much longer to recover, sometimes longer than 10 years. And they don't always recover to the same benthic communities that were there originally before the operation and the DSTP started. And how quickly they recover depends on many factors. It depends on the, the sediment and the tailings characteristics and whether there's any organics there to feed the organisms. It depends a lot too on the natural sedimentation rates. So if you've got an operation that's close to the coast with a large river, that's got lots of organic material coming down in a high rainfall area, then you're going to get high amounts of natural sediments coming back into the system with organic matter. So recovery would be faster potentially than if you're in an area that doesn't have a large river discharge with organics. So the recovery depends also on the availability of larval recruits to come into the area, depending on the currents, and the currents are really quite slow at depth compared to on the surface. And it also depends on the spatial area that those um, uh, tailings covered in the first place. And from work largely in the Northern Hemisphere, they found that, that it's the polychaete worms that are really the first to colonize the sediments. And then it takes much longer for the larger, slow growing taxa to, um, to come back into the environment. And we have some information from the closed Misama mine in Papua New Guinea, but that mine only operated for a few years. So um, they're still looking at recovery information since that was closed. I want to spend the last little time just briefly talking about a case study. And this was the Batuhiju copper mine that I mentioned, the largest global DSTP operation in, in the world. It commenced in the year 2000, so it's been going for just over 20 years, and um, it's discharging and processing many tonnes of ore uh, per day. So this particular mine, it has a pipeline that discharges into the environment at 125 metres depth. 
And the idea is the tailings go down the slope and deposit into the Samunu Canyon. And this canyon's of several kilometres from the shore. And the tailings ultimately go down to 4,000 metres and settle on the bottom of the canyon, some 50 kilometres offshore. Probably about 84%, 85% of the tailings goes down into the canyon and probably about 16% ends up in plumes and, and potentially moving further afield. One of the interesting things about this, and one of the colleagues on the project who was involved in the original impact assessment before the project started, was that they predicted with their models, their dispersion and tailings density models, that the tailings would settle in the canyon over an area of about 200 square kilometres. But in actual fact, what they found many years later is that the area the tailings are settling on, the tailings footprint, is at least 10 times greater than those models predicted. So there's been movement of the tailings out to the east and the west of the Sununu Canyon, and, and they find tailings over a very large area compared to what was predicted. The tailings maximum thickness is up to about 64 centimetres, so it's well over that five centimetre threshold to cause smothering. And so this was quite a surprise, I think, to to the operation that the tailings had moved further over a large area. But where they've moved to, they are very patchy and, and often the patchiness away from the pipeline, the thicknesses are only less than 0.1 millimetres. So it's um, not a very thick deposit, um, but it has moved further than what they expected. And they know that it's moved further because they do a lot of monitoring. So they look at the tailing signature on the deep sea floor, so they know from the depth of the tailings, the metals in the tailings, so they can very well characterise where those tailings have moved to just by taking sediment samples off the floor of the canyon, so they can map its dispersion. They also do a lot of other monitoring, I, I won't go into it, but they measure metals, solids, they do tox testing, they look at the benthic and planktonic communities on a regular basis. And I'll just show you some of the results very quickly before I finish. This is the copper in the water column. Now, they use a slightly different zonation than what we used in our risk assessment. So they have a, a mixing zone, which is the water and the sediment that's greater, that greater than 120 metres depth, right where that discharge is in the canyon. So that's the zone A. And in zone A, these are the copper concentrations in the water. And you can see they range up to about 60 micrograms per litre uh, in that zone. But when we look at the other zone, so the water above that, that's the shallow water in the mixing zone, and in the waters in what we would have called the secondary deposition zone, so outside the predicted zone of impact, the concentrations of copper are much lower. They're actually um, usually less than about um, six micrograms per litre and less than their permit limit. So we really only have a problem in these deeper waters um, in that mixing zone where the regulations don't apply. So um, yeah, so you can very see that very quickly those concentrations go down towards background. In the sediments, it's interesting. The sediments in that mixing zone are actually highly contaminated with copper. They can contain up to a thousand milligrams per kilogram of copper. And this was a sampling that was done a few years ago in a more recent sampling event. So they get lots of copper in the sediments in that mixing zone. But as soon as they move away from that zone, either into the upper waters or further afield, then the concentrations in the sediments is, is very low. Um, and so that's comforting that the, the tailings material is not being too widely dispersed, at least it doesn't contain high concentrations of metals. Interestingly, in Indonesia, they don't have any sediment quality guidelines for metals. And so when we're dealing with it, we usually use our Australasian guidelines to give us some indication of whether there might be any concerns. Just quickly, they also do monitoring. They monitor the macrobenthos in the sediments. And the red line here is just the abundance of macrofauna in the sediment in the mixing zone, zone A. And you can see that there's virtually nothing. They've been completely smothered, this red line here. There's virtually no macrofauna in that uh, tailings area compared to the, the green line, which is the reference site and the blue line which is outside the canyon in the secondary deposition zone where there's quite a healthy abundance of macrofauna. So it's really this primary zone that's impacted in terms of the macrofauna and there's very little left there. And for the myofauna and the, uh, the, the things like copepods and nematodes that are very small, 
It's the same sort of thing in this mixing zone. The sediments are quite depauperate in the microfauna and the microbes. That's the red line. And the abundance is much greater in the shallow waters above it and also out into the reference and control sites. So this is the, the monitoring that they do regularly so that they can see exactly where, you know, this is perhaps the predicted plume is the blue line. And this is where the, the plume is going. So you can see by doing the monitoring, they can tell how far that footprint of the tailings is spreading. So if we then think about, all right, how did our generic risk framework predict um, what was happening at the Bardo Hijau mine? And certainly um, our framework predicted that both in that primary deposition zone, there'd be smothering, uh, and in the secondary deposition zone, um, there'd be smothering. And so the risk was at least as predicted and in some cases more than predicted. But our framework predicted that there would also be smothering and starvation and metal toxicity in this secondary deposition zone, whereas the monitoring at Baruhijo showed actually the risk was much less than predicted, which was interesting. So in this particular location, our framework overpredicted risk, so it was overly conservative. And similarly, in the De deposition zone further away in the water column, we were predicting that metal bioaccumulation and there'd be increased turbidity from the plumes that they would be risk, but actually the risk that they found at Barahiju was much lower. They didn't find metal bioaccumulation in fish in the zone and they didn't find increased turbidity because those plume shears um, stayed uh, right at depth and didn't extend far into this secondary deposition zone away from the pipe. So what we'd love to do, of course, is to apply our generic framework to a particular location in future. Um, and that would be something that we'd, we'd want to do if we could. So just to conclude then, I hope I've shown you that these deep sea tailings placement or these discharges are complex mixtures. They're not just tailings particles, and they can impact both the water column and the benthic biota. The major impact I said is that they, they smother the benthic biota and the habitat. And so the high risk pathways and the very high risk pathways really are only the benthic biota. Other risk pathways scored as, as lower risk or potential risk. In our assessment, because it was sort of semi-quantitative, it was very difficult to look at uncertainty. So we actually had a confidence score of high or low, depending on the data that we had. If you were doing a risk assessment at a real site, at a real DSTP location, you'd be able to potentially um, do much more. You could actually have a much better feel for uncertainty if you could convert some of these causal networks and pathways I described and use probabilistic approaches and Bayesian networks to actually predict the risk and the uncertainty more importantly, something that we couldn't do because we were just developing a generic framework not applicable to any particular site. I think I've hopefully shown you that from the information we have that when the operations cease, there is recovery, but not necessarily to those communities that existed before, and the recovery does take time. And finally, I think because we know that where the tailings are deposited in that primary zone, there's going to be major impacts, it's going to be sacrificed, then I think we should be focusing our monitoring efforts on the secondary deposition zone and making sure that the tailings and the plumes don't extend further than what we predict from the modelling. And we also need to focus on the shallow coastal waters and make sure that those plumes can't get up to the surface and impact on corals and mangroves uh, and sponges and seagrass habitats close to the coast. And with that, I will just acknowledge um, the many people who've been involved in this project, um, both from my own organisation at CSRO and from Oceanic Sciences. Um, also, I'm particularly grateful for uh, Jarina at um, Baruhiju, who gave us permission to, to publish information from their monitoring and their operations, and also for the Metals Environment Research Associations and the technical advisory panel I'm on, and my colleagues on that panel who were able to have input into the design of, of the project. And with that, I'll say thank you and I'll stop sharing so that I can see everyone again back on the screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Stauffer, for giving us such a wonderful talk. And uh, now uh, let's come to the Q&A section. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, Danny, for this uh, really uh, interesting talk. Uh, 
Today we have a uh, Lawrence MacCook uh, from WWF here. Maybe Lawrence, you can fire some questions first. Uh, so he is the director of marine conservation uh, for WWF. You need to open your microphone, Lawrence. Hi, Jenny. Um, nice to see you. I think we've actually met a couple of times and we um, we discussed, in fact, when I was doing the dredge spoil assessment for uh, for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority ne nearly 10 years ago. Isn't that awful? Um, and I noticed Simon Apte's uh, authorship there. So um, first question, a very, very low key one. What's the, the tailings uh, in? Is it in fresh water? No, no. So they mix it with seawater so that it's dense. If it was in fresh water, it would float to the surface and that would be a real problem. So they're very right. careful to de-aerate it and mix it with seawater so that it's got a density so that it flows down that slope to the bottom. So that, that's really important that it's a seawater mix. <clears throat> right. So, um, you know, I mean, ter terrific talk and, and it's really fascinating to see how you've you're trying to quantify or qualify the um the different assessments um <clears throat> how at the end of the day is is there not an intrinsic assumption that that deep sea habitats are worth less than than shallow or on land habitats i mean it is it, it seems to me that's intrinsic to the assumption and so there's a bit of out of sight out of mind to this exactly and look i think that was certainly the case you know with any discharge whether it's deep sea or other discharges into the ocean out of sight out of mind absolutely but i think now as we're finding out more about the deep sea environment and and when you've got groups like you know that I, the video i showed that are looking at the deep sea creatures their unique endemism um, and it's being much better appreciated as an environment so in, in terms of, the, and, and that's why the DSTP operations are highly controversial. Um, mm. I think there's a court case currently for the Ramu nickel mine that has a DSTP operation. Uh, they had a spill, but the spill was actually on land from the pipe in the plant. It wasn't anything to do with the deep sea operations. Um, but there is a court case going on and we weren't able to use uh, any of their data, unfortunately, and we have, have worked um, with them before. So it, it is, um, you know, I think we went into this expecting that we would say, no, you should never do DSTP because of the risks. But I think I think we've come to think on balance that if the location is chosen appropriately and there's agreement about that sacrificial zone, because there will be a sacrificial zone no matter what, if that's over a small area and it's acceptable to the community, then the operations will continue. But I suspect that there's a move uh, against that and that will be very difficult to get some of the operations approved given the community opposition and the greater appreciation as we learn more about the deep sea environment and the unique organisms that live there. So I think people are beginning to understand the more that is known about the deep sea, that it's um, a valuable environment that provides lots of ecosystem services, particularly around nutrient cycling. Uh, it, it, you know, that's one of the key ones um, apart mm. from that beautiful organisms that live there as well. So it's it's really difficult to, you know, to say one way or the other. Um, I think the location operation, the oceanographic conditions, the community need, um, you know, is all really important. I, I guess to put it into perspective, and sorry, this is such a long answer, but to put it into perspective, there are risks with tailing stamps on land as well. Um, you know, we've had multiple tailing stam collapses, you know, in Brazil, in Philippines. And, and so there are huge risks around that. Um, so it's, it's a matter of weighing up the risks. And one of the things we did do as part of the project was look at the risks of DSTP versus on-land tailings storage. Mm. Um, I guess the problem with when it goes into the ocean is you can never recover it. So if there are technologies in future that are able to recover metals from processed tailings that were originally waste, you certainly can't do that when it goes to the bottom of the ocean floor. Whereas if it's in a tailings dam and technologies change, you've got access to those minerals, you know, through another type of processing. So there's there's pluses and minuses about land disposal versus sea, but 
yeah, I, I think it, the jury's out on whether it will continue and whether operations that are not already ongoing will be approved or not by regulators and communities. Yeah, thanks. I, I won't hold the uh, the bandwidth, um, but but just to kind of add to because I've spent quite a lot of time in the last few years uh, with a strong interest in deep sea mining, and of course the one of the you know this there's distinctions and similarities between the two issues um and i you know i was really pleased to hear some of the language that you're using the sacrificial zone you know we need to call it what it is um but just to comment um you know the flip side of course is the more that we can move to a circular economy of these minerals and um you know hopefully without slowing too much the transition to electric vehicles and and low carbon and so on but yes the, the more that we move to a circular economy um and i guess part of that is acknowledging the the financial subsidies that we're essentially making to the mining sector by allowing this kind of um this kind of destruction to happen whether it's on land or sea so we're com comparing on land tailings management or in the deep sea but um the other comparison needs to be, what about we invest the same amount in moving to the circularity? And in which case I strongly suspect Hong Kong's landfills will become even more valuable than the tailing stands. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Really, have, really impressed with the work. When we have the technologies to do that reprocessing, um, you know, that will much less uh, impact on resources or need to, to get the resources out of the ground in the first place and dispose of the waste, whether it's land or, or sea. You're, you're yeah. absolutely correct. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Thanks for a terrific talk. So, are there any questions from our audience, from students? Uh, maybe I, I, I can ask uh, maybe three small questions. First one, I want to know about the progress on the development of uh, international legislation, the law, and also how to ensure that the environmental externality will be covered some way, someone will pay the bill uh, for monitoring and also mitigation. And then the second question is about, uh, in your framework, it seems that uh, you didn't mention the bioaccumulation, especially for metals, uh, how these uh, deep sea organisms respond to this uh, chronic exposure. Um, I suspect that uh, they have a really peculiar life uh, history because they, they go slowly uh, and then uh, they may be a very old animals. Uh, and whether they already have this kind of uh, tolerance because we know that in uh, those hydrothermal wings organisms, they can tolerance to uh, various kinds of pollutants uh, like uh, metals uh, being released in, in the volcanic uh, reaction. Uh, would, would they have a higher tolerance to this kind of exposure? So, uh, and final question is about uh, if we can calculate the carrying capacity, say like what you said, if only a very shallow coverage of those sediments, they seem to recover it quicker. That means if, if we move the pipe, just finish this area, we move to other areas so that uh, we'll have minimum impact, but bigger, geographical impact, which way is better? So I want to know about this. Thank you. Good question. I'll, I'll do them in reverse order because I've probably forgotten the first question. <laughs> now. But, but so the, the last one, um, it's interesting, you know, some others have asked about why they don't move the pipe um, mm -hmm. so that you've got a, a shallower, you know, covering that won't be, won't smother the organisms, you know, it'll be not so thick. Um, and I know that some operations have two pipes, which they use alternately. So I didn't mention it, but the Bado Hijau copper mine that I was talking about actually has two pipes and they use them alternatively. Um, but it still ends up all in that canyon. So it doesn't affect the spatial area so much. Um, they really have the two pipes for other reasons in case there's a, a problem or something or there's a pipe leak and they have to switch something off. Um, I think to move the pipes to spread it, if there was a the technology there, that would be great. Um, the problem is, you know, these are fixed pipelines. They're very complex um, in the way, particularly the mixing tanks before it goes into the pipeline. So it would be a very expensive option to try and have a pipeline, you know, gradually moving across the sea, the, you know, the sea floor, um, especially when you're relying on it going down a continental slope. 
But then, as you said, you've got a larger spatial area if that was to happen. Um, if you could keep a larger spatial area with a tiny thinness, thick, you know, not a very thick layer of tailings, it might be better. Or you, you say, okay, this area in this canyon, it's going to be contained. We're going to, you know, as I said, sacrifice that canyon and make sure that the surrounding area is, you know, um, still pristine. So there's not an answer. It's just, um, you know, is the technology to, to do it? Which one is best? I don't know. It's a matter of the stakeholders to agree with an operation or of what they would prefer, even if the technology was there to move a pipeline, which I don't think it is at the moment. I guess that's where it's different to deep sea mining because in deep sea mining, you've got the sucker on the sea floor that just moves around and everything gets sucked up. The, the minerals get removed and then most of it ends up back down there again, but in a big plume of, of sediment and particles. So you've got lots of issues with, with that waste coming back down from the processing as well. So it's, it's not dissimilar, but I guess that can move around more easily because you've just got a, a, a vessel on the surface that can move um, with the, the sucker and the dredge, whereas with deep sea tailings place, but that, those pipes are, are fixed. Uh, with a second question about bioaccumulation, we didn't find much data on bioaccumulation. You know, we certainly assessed a bioaccumulation of metals as one of our exposure pathways in all those different in different zones. Um, we do know that the organisms have a very different lipid bilayer down at that depth because of the pressures. And so, but what we don't know is what that means in terms of whether they bioaccumulate more or less or very little is known. So we included it as a pathway, and I think it turned out to be potential risk pathway mm -hmm. uh, and a high risk for, for the sediment dwelling organisms, but we don't know very much about it. There's been certainly work on measuring metal concentrations in the biota when mm -hmm. they come to the surface and in the pelagic environment, but it's certainly pathways that we considered. Bioaccumulation was one of our key endpoints, but there wasn't any supportive data in the literature or from the operations that right. could support that, that one way or the other but I'm, I'm sure you're right I'm sure the bioaccumulation rates would be different detoxification processes would be slow uh, uptake would be potentially slower and detoxification slower what that means for the organism health overall mm. I'm not sure um, and your first question you'd have to remind me what that was the, I'm sorry. the lesson or legislation, ah, the legislation. yeah look I, I, I was surprised too that you know, deep sea mining is covered by the ISA, International Seabed Authority, but, but deep sea mining isn't yet. However, there have been moves, there's several organisations and DOSI, D-O-S-I, I'd have to even remember what that stands for now. There is an uh, uh, initiative um, that's been going on for quite some time and they've been developing um, protocols for DSTP uh, and regulation, but as I think that was happening back in 2014, and I don't think there's been agreed publications or agreed positions yet mm. um, uh, out there. So I know that there's draft documents being circulated and I've seen some of them, but we weren't allowed to even cite them in, in our paper in Stoughton. So it's obviously a work in progress and you would hope that regulations would improve through these initiatives such as DOSI. Um, why it's in the London Dumping Convention as an inert material, I'm not sure, because we know that tailings are not inert, they can release contaminants. So it's something that, that needs to be um, improved, just like you know, deep sea mining regulation has, has come a long way recently. Okay, uh, to see any other um, uh, audience would like to ask question. I saw uh, AA AA, um, just, Mr. AA, uh, the name is called AA, just turn on the video. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, we, we also have uh, Professor Loa Tam with us here. Uh, Professor Tam, would you like to ask question or give comment, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jenny. A very nice talk and very in inspiring. I did have a few minor questions. Uh, do you want me to go through three questions together or one after the other? <laughs> one at a time, so I remember. Okay. It's, it's even. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the first question I, in my mind is, of, of course, related to mangroves and seagrass and all those uh, organisms on shore. Because uh, the deep sea tailing placement is actually down to the deep sea and is avoiding the zone of the outwelling. 
that's why I was interesting to to know that you want to monitor uh, the coastal water because you're afraid that there might be some vertical upwards movement. Do you have any um, preliminary findings or do you have any kind of um, theory behind thinking that it's possible that they will affect the coastal organisms? Yeah, the evidence so far is that there has been no impacts on the coastal organisms. So several of the mining operations that, that we've been involved with um, are able to monitor the plumes and they can monitor them even at times when, for example, we know that there's upwellings for several months around August in some of these regions. Um, and so they're able to look at, at upwellings by, by following the plume and they can also estimate the depths of the plume, the upper depth of the plume and so far in the monitoring they've found that they're always below 200 meters or 190 meters and and below the picnic line so that that the plumes um, are not they're, they're designed so that they're denser so that they don't go up into the the shallow waters but they do monitor they monitor mangrove sea grasses corals so a lot of monitoring is done in, because those coastal areas are particularly important for the indigenous communities in those areas uh, where they, they're fishing, you know, artisanal fishing and commercial fishing. So that is probably the most visible impact would be if there were some impact. So they measure tissue concentrations of metals in the fish in that zone. They look at um, bioaccumulation uh, in, in those organisms, corals, seagrass and so on. So, so far with the operations in the few that we've been involved with, um, they haven't found any impacts in the shallow waters. But that's because the locations where the DSTPs operating has to be so well designed. You can't put DSTP in 99% of the world because mm -hmm. only a very small percentage has the right sort of um, steep slopes, deep water close to the coast, you know, not other discharges. So it's it's there's not many places where DSTP would even be allowed, um, either because there's upwellings or um, you know, the picnic line is, is, you know, not sufficient to keep those plumes down at, at depth. But so far, I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, monitoring, but of course, we don't get to see all the confidential monitoring reports either. So mm -hmm. we can only access either the work we do or, or through, you know, public available information. And, and that's why Bardo Hijau has been very forthcoming with their monitoring data over many years to show, you know, what the impacts are or aren't. Okay. My second question is related to the uh, patchy tailings, because based on the case study in Indonesia, you do find it can spread very far away from the pipes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, do you have any monitoring on these patchy tailings? Are they really problematic? Yeah, they are, we are not involved anymore, but they do monitor that secondary zone, you know, in a, in a you know, transient gradients, you know, out on various locations. And they, they do monitor this. So they look for the tailing signature, as I said, by looking at the metal concentrations, the particle size gives it away as well. So they do find these patches, but they mostly finding that they're very, very thin, mm -hmm. um, not, not consistently across a whole area. So for your motile species that can move, they're probably okay. But for species that are stuck and sessile, they're more at risk. Um, so the question is, can they, you know, what sort of depth can they survive in? And, you know, mostly in the Western Pacific, um, the, the general feeling is amongst the industry is that in our area, the Western Pacific, these tailings in these zones are very thinly spread, admittedly over a wider area, unlike what's done in the Northern Hemisphere in the past with the shallower depositions where they had metres and metres and metres of tailings in a confined area. Um, whereas we have it much more dispersed and much thinner um, just because of the environment in the Western Pacific, the oceanographic environment. So, um, but certainly, I mean, I still think that that zone, that secondary zone mm -hmm. is the key to monitoring because that's where you don't want there to be impacts. You can agree on a sacrificial zone, but you don't want impacts beyond that footprint. Um, mm -hmm. And particularly you want better models to be able to model the footprint before the operation starts. You know, they haven't been hugely successful in the past, um, you know, in that case where it was a, a wider footprint, thin, but wider footprint than expected. Because of the widespread of this patchy tailings, it's difficult to see the boundary of or the area of the secondary deposition, so you need to monitor. And with limited resources or restricted budget, 
it's difficult to, to know where, how far we should go and look for the patchy tailing. And for me, I, I find it very difficult because it's spread actually to thousands of kilometers away from the pipes. And so it's even away from the secondary zone at the beginning, defined at the beginning when they start this tailing dumping, right? Is it correct? It, it may not be thousands of kilometers. I, mm -hmm. uh, it was, that was a square kilometer spatial area I was talking okay. about, not, not linear kilometers. So it okay. wouldn't go that far, but you know, with a it's patchy, you're right. You know, you can sample and miss a patch, right? And think everything's okay. And right next door, there's a, a patch, you know, so it, it is tricky. That's why they have to do lots of monitoring. And, and the, the governments do insist that they do do that monitoring. There might not be guidelines for metals, but they do have to, they're in the legislation for the, the, um, the project to proceed, they have to commit to, you know, a certain monitoring program and they have to report on that and, and, you know, in many cases it's publicly available, in some cases it's not. So they do have to monitor and, and do a lot of samples. And yes, you're right, it's expensive. You know, to get a sample from 4,000 metres, mm -hmm. you know, drop down a, a, a sediment core up and it takes an hour for mm -hmm. the core to get to the top, to the surface. And that's then you can find that there's nothing in the, the sampler and you've got to, you know, do it all over again. So it's extremely time consuming and expensive to mm -hmm. sample at that depth. Mm -hmm. um, probably that's why the uh, remote operated vehicles, you know, that were shown in that video uh, are so much better because they can take samples, you know, grab samples and, and bring them back to the surface. Yeah. So it, it would be nice if we know, uh, we can design a sampling uh, area or sampling method, then so we need to predict where are these kind of patchy tailings. But of course it's difficult. My last question is actually more related to framework because the framework you mentioned is very interesting. By look at all the pathway you try to do is actually only from single source, single single uh, stressor, single effect, single interaction. Mm -hmm. But you all, you know the stress are actually multiple, and the process are actually multiple, and they interact with each other. Mm -hmm. So is it next step is from this single link, and then become a more multiple. Uh, just like our brain, that we have multiple pathways and link up to the, uh, from the interaction to the stressor to the effect. Is that Absolutely. the next step? Absolutely. And I was wondering if someone would ask me about that because our, the causal networks, as you said, they can talk, they can give you collective effects because you can look at the different pathways and say, well, this pathway is more important than that pathway, but you can't get the cumulative effects mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. pathways. You would have to go to a much more probabilistic approach, I think, with mm. basic networks and, and try and get more of the cumulative effects but really you know when we looked in the literature you know and I have got a section in the paper in Stoughton that's hopefully going to be out soon that that talks about the multiple stresses but mm. you no know, it's it's extremely difficult to do and um, it's beyond what we can do in this framework at the moment um, but it's a really important point um, and it's something that we need to get more information on, but there isn't a lot of data out there from these type of operations. Um, so we can get collective effects, but not cumulative effects mm -hmm. from multiple okay. stress. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, because I have so much, so many questions because the talk is so stimulating. I thought the framework can be applied to any yes. environment, not only to the deep sea tailing placement, any dumping of anything or a wastewater or waste. We, we should um, employ this kind of, concept or framework, mm -hmm. but more important is one stress will be affected by the other stress. So the output of this stress will be changed when you have another stress happen in the same environment. That's why I'm interested to follow up with your publication and see what's next. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Chen. I also see uh, Dr. Wang Ying uh, from Beijing. Uh, Dr. Wang, would you like to ask Questions uh, because uh, Dr. Wang is uh, also working on metals pollution. Uh, Ying, are you here? Uh, yes, good, 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 good. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, listen a very good uh, uh, lecture, and uh, because I just uh, uh, do a model about uh, not 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 for the risk, but I just uh, do some. Uh, heavy metal uh, uh, toxicity, and uh, I notice uh, that uh, you have 
on the uh, copper in sediment. So um, I, I want to know if your if your this uh, uh, model could uh, use in uh, maybe for the aquatic uh, uh, environment uh, risk assessment. And I I know you 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 have to some some in water because you have collected some um uh. uh um, maybe it's dissolved dissolve the cooper uh, in different zone. Um, but I cause um I will do uh, uh, projects about the maybe for the Yangtze River. So that is a huge uh, river. So I want to know if we, uh, your framework is suitable. Yeah, look, yes. the framework I think is quite generic and it can be applied to anything. In fact, we first started using these causal pathways and networks for a completely different, um, uh, it was actually looking at the impacts of tight gas and shale gas deep down in the land yes. and, and looking at what the impacts of that was on the terrestrial in, and aquatic environment, freshwater environment. So you can use this framework for any application. It could be, you know, copper and multiple pollutants in the Yangtze River or, or other aquatic environments. So um, I, I think okay. it's quite applicable to, to many different situation but, uh yes but the uh i think uh, yeah i think so but in the pathway it's, it's not very, non, not the same i, I think it's mm. a it's a difference yeah. right yeah the pathways will the sources will be different the the um stresses will be different the processes will be different but the actual pathways and the networks that you can build and the way you can score them you know could be applied to to any situation yeah but i think the Framework about the source process transfer is, is, is the same because uh, we could use this uh, structure for, for, for the fresh water, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And yeah. I know there's a few questions in the chat, Kenny. So do you want me to address any of those questions? Uh, Sai you can read them out for us. Yeah. And uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Meng Yang Liu. Uh, dear Jenny, thank you for this nice talk. I have a question about the potential thermal pollution. Are the seawater temperatures mm -hmm. are different between the tailing discharge and the surrounding deep sea? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that's a good question. And yes, they are. So the temperature is one of the stressors that we looked at in the mixing zone near the pipe. And the tailings liquor can sometimes come out at much higher temperatures than than. But remember, that's only at 100 metres, so it's it's warmer than the surrounding seawater, but it very rapidly gets diluted with seawater, so the temperatures come down really quickly. And so we didn't find that temperature or thermal pollution was a, a large risk compared to some of the other pathways, but we did assess it. I, I think it came out as, as a low risk beyond a very narrow, um, small spatial area. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And another question from Thea. Thank you very much for the interesting talk, Jenny. Quick question. Considering that this region is also heavily impacted by climate change, do you have any thoughts on how the impacts of climate change will impact the primary or secondary zones? For example, increased cyclones. Yes, that's a really good question. And we're considering climate change in lots of other uh, risk frameworks. I think one of the biggest risks, for example, of the extreme events like the hurricane cyclones would be pipe breaks and pipe failures, you know, in that, that upper zone. So if you had a cyclone come through and cause a physical break in the pipe, that could lead to um, release of, of tailings and make that a much higher risk pathway. Um, it was scored as high risk, but, you know, it was scored as probably um, possible but not likely. I think under climate change that may well become more likely. Um, so, so that's one of the impacts. In terms of the deep sea, you know, I think uh, the deep sea environment, I guess my naive feeling is that it's probably fairly well protected at the moment from changes in temperature. Um, however, if you've got increased rainfall on land and you've got more river discharge and river plumes and organic matter, falling down into the ocean and settling down onto the ocean floor, then maybe that would change the nutrient cycling uh, down in the deep sea, which could also impact the types of organisms and the processes that go on, particularly the microbial processes. So that might be another potential impact of climate change if there's 
increased rainfall in particular on land. Uh, in terms of acidification, well, the pH is lower at depth anyway. So you've already got um, problems for calcifying organisms. So whether that could be influenced at that depth uh, um, further, uh, I'm not sure, but good question. Thank you very much. And a question from Dr. Xiao Yuxu. Thank you for this interesting seminar. I have questions about the definition of material risk. Yes, so material risk is, that was those two levels of consequence, you know, it was either significant, in other words, a significant impact, material impact, or a not so significant one, a smaller impact. And the way we decided on what was material or not was really, it depended on the um, stressor, the um, duration of the exposure, the frequency of the exposure, the area of the exposure, and then on the receptor, whether that receptor we thought was likely to be more vulnerable to that stressor, um, whether there was evidence that it was going to be resilient or tolerant. So we used all of that information in a subjective way to try and decide whether that risk was, was a, a big risk, significant, material, or not material. We could have had more levels of consequence. Often in risk assessments, you've got more levels, um, but we just didn't have the data to conclude much more than whether it was going to be a big effect or not so important an effect. So that, that's why we use the word material. I see a Dr. Wickiv Lai. Uh, would you mind just uh, speak up uh, your question You're by yourself, Wickiv? Yes, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yes, we can, we can hear you. Hear you. Yeah, 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 thank you. Uh, thank you for Professor Chen's first presentation. I just have a quick question inspired by Professor Nora Tan just now. I, I have come across some of these assessment studies that use the sum of risk quotient to estimate the impact of like chemical mixtures. I'm wondering if it's possible to apply the same effort in the risk framework that you in this study. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it, it's possible for some of the contaminants, say perhaps you could sum the metals, for example, but I think it would be very difficult to, to sum risk quotients for a metal versus um, a temperature change versus noise, um, you know, versus particle smothering, because they're all very different modes of action. And, and normally when we sum risk quotients, the stressor has to have a similar mode of action. Um, even summing metals is probably not correct because they have different modes of action. So I think it, it's certainly one way that people are using um, to look at mixture toxicity, but um, it's tricky if you've got a mixture of chemical and physical um, stressors in this case. But you could do it perhaps partially for some of the, some of the stressors. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so uh, any follow-up questions from audience? Uh, Professor Tan, please. Uh, Jenny, uh, uh, just from the discussion about uh, climate change, I was thinking about acidification because if the acidity of the seawater increased, uh, the heavy metals in the tailings might release more or they might change the speciation and might be more available to organisms. Have you ever considered that uh, in your assessment? Yeah, from, from the tailings perspective, the only thing I think is that they can, at the process plant before it gets into the pipe to be discharged, if there was changes caused such as pH changes, they can manipulate that. They can neutralize the tailings by adding more seawater or they can change the process. They can tweak that process so they could mitigate a pH change um, at that point, um, recognizing that pH in the ocean is already lower at depth anyway by about 0.15 pH units. So, so uh, I'm just not sure how much climate change would impact the pH at depth. I think they could control the pH of the tailing so that there wasn't those speciation changes. Um, you know, it's all about process control, the engineering mitigation, if you like, up front, rather than the adaptive management on the seafloor. So, sorry, I made a mistake. I should say that for those deposits in the sediment, if the seawater uh, changed to become more acidified, will yes. that have more release of the heavy metals from the sediment deposition to be suspended back to the seawater? Uh, I, I should 
I, I was thinking about the gutter from the tailing and the tailing in the sediment and the sediment with suspension of the heavy metal due to change in acidity. Yes, you're quite right. It could it could impact the speciation and the release of metals if the pH dropped down at that benthic, uh, you know, water interface. It, it's quite possible uh, that could happen. I'm not sure how pressure and temperature affect that kind of, you know, the, the pressure and the temperature might outweigh any pH effect at that depth in terms of remobilization of contaminants. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's certainly something that we'd have to think about in future, I think. Hmm. So uh, given the time limitation, the final question I would like to ask on behalf of all the females uh, research students and postdocs here, would, would you like to provide us some tips how they can build a, a successful career in science? I, I always say one of the best ways is to volunteer. So through volunteering to be on professional societies, you can build your network and get to know people internationally. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, to be part of societies like Society for Ecotoxicology and uh, Environmental Chemistry and Toxicology, CTAC. Uh, I think that volunteerism is, is part of the, the process. Volunteer, get out of your comfort zone. Um, and the other thing I always encourage my students is I have, um, what we say is um, you've got to be in it to win it. What that means is you've got to put yourself forward for opportunities, whether that's for awards, whether that's for travel grants, um, to attend conferences. You have to put yourself forward because no one, unless you've got a really good mentor or supervisor, no one will do that for you. You have to, as a female, perhaps be a little bit pushier and put yourself forward and grasp those opportunities. So that's why we say you've got to be in it to win it. So don't be shy in coming forward and promoting your science and promoting yourself and building those networks through volunteering for professional societies, you know, to be, you know, secretary or treasurer or student rep or, or whatever that might be, because uh, that will build the network. It will get your visibility. People around the world will get to know you and respect you for the work that you're doing. And of course, hard work, nothing beats hard work as well. And we know that particularly in, in, in Asia and Australasia, that's an important part of success. Uh, hard work and achievement will come. Excellent advice. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for your wonderful talk and also sharing. Uh, I want to promote for the next talk, we're going to have a, a Canadian, uh, also uh, academician, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Bing Chang. Uh, he is an environmental engineer. He's going to talk about some uh, latest advance in uh, pollution control and, and also uh, mitigation of oil spill. Uh, then uh, we will schedule his talk in uh, July. Uh, so now I hand over back to Sai Ying. Um, we still have many questions here, but the time is up. I have to skip to the end. I really appreciate the wonderful and informative talk Dr. Stauber gave us today. We expect more opportunities to talk to Dr. Stauber again. So I appreciate the Stakey Lab of Marine Pollution for launching this distinguished lecture and also thank the Department of Chemistry for helping organize the event. Thank all the audience for your time and active participation. We look forward to meeting you again in the next distinguished lecture. Thank you very much and thank bye. You. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, bye -bye. Thank thank you very you. much. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.